Do I start? Hi everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, in our discussion of this uh, search for Singaporean sounds. And uh, uh, Chiron Lee, my colleague, is also here to um, play some um, pieces by Singaporean composers and also um, talk about some frameworks which uh, might relate to um, a way of, or a, a new ways of looking at Singaporean music or Singaporean musics in a plural sense. Yeah, and this is Zhang Yi, who is a very prolific composer and also assistant professor at Yong Siu Cho. Need to unmute. Ah, sorry. <laughs> And this is Zhang Yi, who is assistant professor and also a prolific composer, um, whose works have been performed by major orchestras here in Singapore and also abroad. So uh, let's begin. The purpose of our presentation today is to explore alternative ways of construing and understanding transcultural music with compositional, performative, scholarly, and critical applications of the two theoretical frameworks that we will discuss. Transculturalism refers to elements that extend through more than one culture. And in the context of today's discussion, we're discussing the music of Western schooled Singaporean composers and exploring the stylistic distinctions and generalities that we can glean from their music. Due to, the, due to the limited duration and scope of today's presentation, we'll only be skimming the surface of this extremely broad topic. And we're just sharing some thoughts that we have as we delve deeper into this trajectory of exploration. So it's very much still work in progress for us, but we wanted to use this opportunity to think through some of the issues that we've been investigating as composer and as performer with regard to this music. So uh, one of the questions that we polled our, or rather people following the YST Conservatory Instagram page was, how do you tell if a work is Singaporean? And Lamadeus official replied, Instead of do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, it is do, re, mi, fa, so, la, si. Haha. <laughs> Thank you, Lamadeus official, for this joke. So, um, on that, um, sing very uh, quintessential <laughs> Singlish <laughs> words. Uh, <laughs> share some of my inspirations when, when I am actually composing and um, when, when I am trying to draw on any sort of Singaporeanness. So art, uh, Singaporean art, um, Southeast Asian art, um, or arts in general, poetry by Singaporean writers or writers based here and uh, as well as around the region, so um, those two um, other art forms other than music uh, represents uh, this, this ekphrasis, which is uh, taking inspiration, uh, describing within the, uh, a different art form what it, the original source is uh, called ekphrasis as, an, uh, as a process, as a, as a way to create uh, new art. And of course, culture heritage, uh, personal stories or interesting stories. Um, and of course, my favorite, Singlish. And um, this is a painting by Liu Kang from 1975 called Life by the River. And this has been a great source of inspiration for, for me. Um, it's housed at the National Gallery and they've even made a interactive artwork and playground 
for children at, at, an, at the first level of the National Gallery. So what's interesting about this work is that uh, so many things happening and this is an, a prime example of the Nanyang style of painting, which has, uh, you know, uh, this, this rather uh, very strong and bold angular shapes combined with uh, uh, this Chinese, um, almost like a scroll painting kind of form. Um, as well as very vibrant colors. So this is a kampong, I believe, uh, by the river. And I've written a saxophone piece based on it. Um, and I'm working on a, an opera. Um, as you can see, there's so, so many characters there. And, and I, th I thought while right, when I was writing this saxophone piece that it really lends itself into uh, an opera. And uh, that is one of my um, recent, uh, you know, compositional trend and uh, sorry directions, and this was one of the pictures I took when I visited one the, the last uh, kampong in Singapore, and there's this uh, this conflict between the old, the heritage, and the new, and the title of this work in progress is Kampong Spirit, and what it means uh, in in the past as well as whether there is still a kampong spirit even though the kampongs are mostly gone um, so obviously that takes uh, that uh, is inspired by heritage and culture and in a different work uh, this triple concerto I wrote for a tour for the YSD Orchestra. It features, features three um, soloists, and they happen to be uh, students in the conservatory playing non-Western instruments. So uh, we thought it was interesting to showcase that in a fusion concerto where, where the soloists are playing uh, non-Western instruments, the Erhu, the Zongran, and the Pai Ku. And the interesting part is in the percussion solo where he, he traverses between the, the marimba and the paiku. Well, the marimba could be seen as a Western instrument or, or African maybe, there's some roots there. And of course, it, it also has uh, some um, resonances in, in uh, Southeast Asian uh, musical cultures. So anyway, uh, San Ren Sing uh, is, is this Confucian uh, saying um, well, because the three people traveling on the concert tour it was like a, the really obvious um, title that uh, came, came out and, and that uh, relates to this um, borrowing of Chinese culture and uh, this uh, East Asian uh, sphere of uh, cultural sphere that uh, is from, you know, uh, relates, to, relates to China, to Japan, South Korea, Korea, um, Singapore, and, and um, the Straits, basically. Yeah. And, uh, and in another piece, uh, another concerto, this is um, written for SG50, it was based on the national flower, Vanda, Miss Joachim. And uh, it, it, I chose this uh, theme because uh, Miss Joachim, Joachim sounds like Joachim, which is the great violinist that uh, Brahms wrote a violin concerto for. So I thought that was a nice coincidence. And the Vanda, um, well, back then there was, there was no musical work that was uh, based on this uh, title or this theme. So I thought it was a nice... Uh, um, way to pay tribute to the national flower uh, and how it uh, how it um, relates to the music is uh, in in the exposition in the first part of the the first movement um, the, the the two themes are presented so it represents the parents orchids and then uh, when it returns in the reprise in the recapitulation they are fused together as a hybrid theme so this is a musical uh, an expression of uh, nationalistic um, idea um, well suitable for a national day concert and um, lastly um, there is uh, this group of three um, this cycle of three chamber operas that I've been working on for uh, between 2012 to 2018 uh, called Singapore Trilogy and it's about uh, laksa it's about shopping it's about uh, 
copy uh, or the copy them and so so this this uh, really Singaporean um, activities and uh, loves of food and shopping and um, beverage uh, became the subject matter for um, three chamber operas which employs singlish so i'm now finally getting to the point of singlish and uh, in in um, american uh, this american anthropologist uh, clifford gitt's um, book the interpretation of cultures um, you basically um, observe that uh, language choice of a young nation um, it's uh, you, it usually uh, occurs at some point when the the nation is formed already and and then the 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 government is trying to to create a sense of new identity so language choice um, we can observe in our own country is a interesting trajectory where where Malay was uh, chosen as a national language and then uh, but uh, due to um, you know, an obvious colonial past, uh, English was also conveniently um, used as the official language. So that, um, and of course, uh, with the confluence and the, the mix of uh, different races, uh, we, we get uh, from the ground up, from the people, a uh, type of uh, new uh, colloquial language, uh, which we know uh, as English, which uh, it's it's um, interesting because it's not uh, it's not created or it's not supported by the state, um, not from a top down approach, but from a ground up approach where where the people really take pride in in Singlish and they they enjoy speaking it and, and it gives a real sense of uh, belonging, not not uh, you know to be official and speaking in standard English. The whole time, so 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 to me, a national, the real national language is English. And uh, in an example of um, how how I use English as a resource is is mixing or, or rather notating it in a, is in a Sprechstimme kind of way where uh, spoken uh, Singlish is mixed with half uh, half sung and then sung words. So there is a spectrum within between a spoken, half spoken, half sung, and fully sung. So that is uh, how I see it uh, in, in my work, for, uh, at least within the trilogy, where Singlish is a musical resource. I need that extra kick in my life. Right, so that is from Laksa Cantata, a recitative um, between uh, Stephen and the bride to be. And in Kopi for One, uh, there are three characters, and uh, here the, the different types of English or Singlish that is spoken uh, kind of places um, this uh, level of uh, formality or a, a level of uh, casualness or colloquialness. And um, 
So for that example, uh, it, it's a recitative between the, the Kopitiam auntie and, and this loyal customer. So we can hear uh, uh, it's, it's, it's this, this mix of uh, normal English and then sometimes it goes into more uh, singlish kind of thing. So there, there is a spectrum uh, even within one person's speaking. It, it, it is uh, based on the situation where we traverse this, um, what uh, some linguists call di diglossia. So this is a, a book by uh, Lionel Wee, um, NUS Prof of Linguistics. And um, he basically um, looks at different models that place English uh, into a spectrum or um, within a, a model or a, a theoretical framework. And he dismisses some of these models as being too static because uh, Singlish is, is such a fluid and, and a flexible um, language. So uh, diglossia is one of that uh, controversial, um, you know, this, this high and low uh, English, uh, standard English versus a colloquial Singaporean English. So the standard uh, normal English and uh, Singlish, basically. And there is another model called the three circles model, which uh, Kind of uh, geographically uh, shows us where the uh, sources of uh, where it's English is English is used as a main language uh, in UK, US, Canada, etc., and in former colonies such as Singapore, Malaysia, India, and then the third circle is where English is used as a foreign language, so like South Korea, Japan, China, etc. So this is the three circles model, which, which is also limited in a way. And this is a quote from um, the book where he, he argues for uh, more dynamic models of, uh, to explain the nature of Singlish and where we have to take into account uh, migration, globalization and other um, factors. So I went ahead and made a chart based on some of these models. Um, and one of it is demographics, one of it is cultural um, orientation, um, the cultural orientation model. And then there uh, on the, um, this vertical axis, it's the diglossia, this high and low Englishes, cultural orientation, um, just, I mean, for lack of a better and new, more nuanced way of putting this, um, this is the typical CMIO, Chinese, Malay, Indian, others, uh, in terms of ethnic races, and generational uh, kind of demographic um, factors. And this uh, point, this high point in this, this, um, um, this graph is where I would place my own uh, singlish or spoken, just normal spoken English. Of course, it, it, it fluctuates uh, depending on situation. And uh, so uh, uh, C meaning I am of Chinese descent or I, that's my cultural orientation. And, and uh, five meaning is just a you know, regular medium level of uh, formality or uh, between really standard English and really Singlish uh, colloquialism. And then uh, to date myself, uh, Gen Y, according to, well, it depends on what source we, we categorize this uh, Gen X, Y, and Z, all right? So, so that is one way of uh, visualizing for me when I, when I was um, studying these uh, models of Singlish when I was researching on the operas. So um, what I thought, uh, this, this could really work as a model to, to place the different types of Singaporean music, which is so diverse and so fluid, depending on who is composing, for what purpose, for what occasion. Even within a single composer, there is a, a range and it, it, it navigates in this, this space that is not flat or a straight line, but is, is this very fluid uh, space. And of course, we have to take into account uh, of, uh, again, internationalization, globalization, migration, different influences and interests of an individual musician. Or composer. So for um, one of uh, 
uh, pre previous teachers and uh, still um, now colleague at uh, Yongsito Conservatory, Tony Macaromis. Um, rather new work, Jewel of Shirajaya, is, is, is a prime example of that. And uh, all the musicians who has gone through uh, his class has, uh, I'm sure, has fond memories of his Takadimi um, Indian rhythmic exercises as, as a way to, to rhythmicize um, music, right? Using um, these conical uh, syllables. So in, in this piece, um, according to Tony, he, he takes this uh, Palak scale, which is also uh, a raga in, in, in South Indian music, Carnatic music, um, as a basis for, for the alapana, which is this opening um, section of, of uh, you know, uh, uh, Carnatic music, where, where the scale is being extemporized and introduced. So, um, and he transplants it into the orchestra with a flute. So we're on the Indian, Indian flute to the Western flute. And then in, in a genre kind of setting, uh, obviously we see two solo instruments that is non-Western. We have Mirangam and then we have the tabla, uh, the South and the Northern uh, Indian um, instruments, drums, right? So, so this this is uh, what um, what we usually call as a fusion concerto, yeah, where a non-Western instrument is the soloist instrument, a solo solo instrument, uh, backed with a Western orchestra. So maybe we have a listen. So um, we, I, I hear some globalization kind of factors in there, and uh, with uh, well, Tony is also a professor of jazz, so so there is some sort of influence there, uh, which makes it more cosmopolitan. And of course, we have the timbres of the ethnic instruments, uh, then here joined in by the uh, Chinese gong, right? Um, uh, this this uh, Peking gong that that uh, has this pitch bend, so um, again, uh, maybe suitable for national day uh, concerts, which is um, then. So what? <laughs> to quote a uh, jazz tune, how does how does that place within this this? Uh, proposed model of Singlish. So uh, to transplant these uh, models of Singlish into um, to see how we can place uh, Singaporean concert music, uh, this is what I, I found out uh, could be a parallel, that the cultural orientation, generational, uh, could be a similar axis on, on this uh, horizontal and uh, depth axis. And uh, we change the diglossia into a uh, more formal, more complex, and more accessible. So it, 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 we could uh, replace that with a stylistic spectrum where complexity and accessibility uh, becomes this high and low um, axis of a uh, spectrum. So, so in, in, in this way, in this piece, the, well, the cultural orientation is predominantly Indian as uh, mandated by the commission. 
which is North and Southern Indian influences. And uh, if we put it uh, uh, in the middle, I, I think there's a lot of complexity in the music, but yet it's very accessible in, in terms of the harmonies and the mel melodic um, factors. So, so it's somewhere there in the sweet spot of, uh, between complex and accessible. So, um, and then, um, well, generational, uh, this axis may be not so immediately useful if we look at that is uh, whether it's Gen X or Baby Boomer or Gen Y. So, um, so uh, once again, this is just just uh, thinking out loud and trying to um, borrow this framework of uh, sing singlish uh, to apply it to Singaporean musics. So I'll pass the mic to Chiran now. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you, Zhang Yi. So, okay. What do we do with all of this? Zhang Yi, I thought it was especially interesting to hear the different levels of diglossia, even in the short excerpt of the Laksa Cantata. And yeah, what, what do we do with these theoretical frameworks? What do we do with these graphs? Um, I just want to add that for myself, the impetus to explore these hybrid or transcultural works in a more rigorous manner came from my recent extended engagement with these musics. Firstly, um, in a co-produced show called A Rojak Night of Music, which was put up in London, right before Circuit Breaker, that's very lucky. And secondly, with the Composer Society of Singapore Commission for a digital concert that will be coming up in November. I think that we should situate this discussion within a larger discourse about the hybrid nature of music from composers whose ethnic identity is Asian, but have been schooled in a Western art music tradition, such as the two of us, these composers write permeable, fluid music that flows between the cultural identities of the East and the West. And I think that the stylistic distinctions of their music necessitate special consideration from a performative point of view, which is what I'll be talking about for the remainder of the 20 minutes. Of course, the notion of the East and West is a slightly unstable one, and one might also say that there is no East and West, it's, music is universal. And this in itself is a contentious statement. Scholars such as Asian American musicologist Nina Yang would go as far as to call out such appeals to a universalist discourse of Western classical music as rendering Asian participation in this cultural practice unnatural or less than salutary. Um, this is from her 2007 article, East and West in Concert Hall. So I think that the purpose of this discussion is to move beyond defensive notions of what is Eastern, what is Western, what is transcultural music, but rather to move towards constructive applications of these um, theoretical frameworks. How do we approach this music as composers, performers, and audiences? And how do we make sense of these stylistic distinctions in order to allow for a multiplicity of perspectives and voices to emerge and create relevance with the globalized stage of the 20th century, 21st century, sorry. So in my exploration of such music, I have noticed some interpretative challenges that are specific to this category of transcultural music. As someone who has been schooled exclusively in the Western art music tradition, I've only had limited engagement with any kind of non-Western music, rather unfortunately. Um, so I would like to discuss some of these challenges looking at three pieces by Zhang Yi, Shafika Ada Salahin, and also Wang Chenwei, three Singaporean composers, in order to move towards solving some of these challenges and to unite scholarly research on this topic with performance applications. So the first piece we'll be listening to is Shafika Ada Salahin's Malagai. So she uses influences from 
classical Malay music. So Shafika is a Malay is a traditional Malay music practitioner. Um, she was one of the co-founders of the Open Score project, which is a orchestra made out of instruments from all kinds of different cultures. It's super cool stuff. And um, I've also invited her to give workshops at, on kompang drumming at the at Yeo and Yeo's College, where I teach part time. So it's been really interesting discussing this with her and also performing her music and learning more about Malay music through her work. So she shared with me that Malagai means palace in Malay, which alludes to the sense of bliss that un unfolds a new couple as they build a life together. So I'm going to be demonstrating at the piano two aspects of how she borrows from classical Malay music. Firstly, ornamentation from the Asli genre of Malay music. And secondly, the lively middle section that employs kompang or rather Malay hand drum rhythms. So Asli is a traditional form of Malay music and um, it utilizes ornamentation that is very florid around a center note, such as. So in Western art music, we'll call this a turn, but it's not just a turn really, it's a turn that's played in a very stylistic way, like, or. So how it sounds in the melody is, will be, So do listen out for that when you listen to the rest of the piece in a bit. Uh, the second element that I would like to talk about is her use of kompang rhythms. Kompang is a type of Malay hand drum that is often used for ceremonial purposes such as weddings and uh, celebrations. So it employs inter very complex interlocking rhythms. And on the piano, um, this is how it sounds like. So you can almost imagine one drum going. And the other one playing on the downbeat. And together they sound like. So let's listen to the whole piece now.
Musicologist Yayoi Uno Everett has proposed a taxonomy for identifying the types of musical synthesis based on selected repertoire. And what I want to do uh, in this slide is to look at Shafika's piece, Malagai, through the lens of this uh, spectrum. As Everett herself has noted, the repertoire, the, rep the repertoire of art music has moved beyond Orientalist and exotic paradigms of cultural appropriation and therefore invites a careful negotiation between collective discourses and individual subjectivities in building avenues for interpretation. I think the key, word, the key phrase here is building avenues for interpretation. And um, a lot of this academic discourse so far um, you know, remains in the academic realm. So let's look at how we can find performance implications for this research. I personally found this framework very useful for identifying the degree to which I can sort of rely on Western art music interpretative paradigm for approaching transcultural music. But I do want to add a caveat that this spectrum or this, te uh, this taxonomy that we see on screen is not a valorization of approaches. Rather, it's a dynamic spectrum of approaches. So even within a single piece of music, we can find different sections that will sit at different points of the spectrum, sometimes even simultaneously. So the piece that we just heard, Malagai by Shafika Ada Salahin, sits in the middle of the spectrum. It is a good example of syncretic music. Syncretic music uh, transplants attributes of timbre, articulation, scale system, basically musical elements onto Western art music. And that is uh, in between the two other ends of the spectrum, which are transference, which refers to when composers draw on aesthetic principles without formal, without uh, when composers draw on aesthetic principles without iconic references to Asian sounds. And one of the examples that Everett has given for this category is John Cage's Music of Changes, which uses organizational principles borrowed from the Chinese text of the I Ching, but without drawing on Chinese sounds. Of course, uh, what is Chinese, what is Western, these musical attributes are also very situated to individual preference. Um, but I think in the case of Shafika's piece, it's quite obvious that she borrows on the Asli tradition of ornamentation and also on the Kompang rhythms. But uh, this piece was actually the most easy to learn in a way because I could still rely on encultured ways of shaping music that were very familiar to, to me as a Western trained pianist, because sh the music still uses um, a ternary ABA form with a fixed climactic point at the retransition right before the return to the A. And you know this is very characteristic of um, say the sonata form, which is a very common musical form in Western music theory. So what happens when I am playing music where I'm not even sure of what is Eastern, what is Western, as I was at the beginning of this journey? Let's listen to our next piece, which is Wang Chunwei's Mid-Autumn Festival. And I'll talk a little bit about that sense of feeling like, hmm, I don't really know what's, what I can do to make this sound better. So here is Chunwei's Mid-Autumn Festival.
So a little bit of background about this piece and the composer. Chen Wei is the main co-author of the Ting Ensemble's Guide to the Chinese Orchestra. And he's also adjunct faculty and composition supervisor at the National Institute of Education. So this is a this is one piece out of a four-piece compendium of piano, piano and violin pieces that were commissioned for the National Piano and Violin Competition that took place last year. When I first got the score to this piece from Chen Wei, I instinctively felt that this music necessitated a different approach. And of course, I had also heard this piece many times when I attended the competition last year as a spectator, but playing it as a pianist, um, there were some parts of it that didn't quite comfortably sit under my fingers. And to articulate this difference, I mean, I couldn't quite place my finger on what was different about this music. So I would like to draw on this quote from Chinese musicologist Bao De Shu, who is based at the Sichuan Conservatory of Music and uh, also happens to be a friend of my grandfather's. When I first started doing research into Chinese versus Western music, I actually found not so many resources in English um, a lot of these resources about differences in music aesthetics between the East and the West were drawing on post-colonial theory, um, which wasn't exactly what I was looking for. However, when I searched for this topic in Chinese, I realized that there was a wealth of information about this. For example, Professor Bao's research is actually part of a course that he teaches at the Sichuan Conservatory, um, and he's also very often quoted in this arena. So here's the Chinese quote and also my translation of it. So he states, in terms of aesthetics, Chinese music art takes harmony as the idea, as the ideal, in line with the Zen philosophy emphasizing intuition and highlights the vitality of life. This is in sharp contrast to the aesthetic characteristics of Western music, which emphasize rationality and thought and take reality, meaning, and emotion as its spiritual pillars. So very abstract language, um, but I think essentially what he's trying to say is that for Western art music, we're always moving towards a goal in the piece. It's theologically built, it's, it's goal-oriented with a climax, oftentimes, you know, before the before the coda, or, I mean, at the coda or in the retransition. And how that translates to performance is that we're always aware of where the climax is and we try to create mini climaxes to build up to this one large climax in order to create a nice arch in terms of musical drama. So one challenge I faced when learning Chen Wei's piece, Mid-Autumn Festival, was that I tried very hard to pinpoint a climactic point in the music and then build up towards it. So this was to the extent that I very, in a very unwise manner, actually asked Chen Wei, can I, can I use double octaves here? And can I put this, you know, one octave lower so that I can create a bigger sound? Um, but that really wasn't the point of the music, I think. As I, as I grew to understand the more time I spent with this music. Uh, to borrow the words of another Chinese scholar, Hu Ye, he notes that Western art music focuses on the outward, outward expressions of heightened emotion, whereas Chinese artists focus on the artist's internal emotional world oftentimes using metaphors of external visualizations of nature and situations to depict the interior, the interior world. In other words, this is an aesthetic of subtle illusion rather than direct representation. And therefore, as a performer, I don't think I needed to work that hard to create a nice arch or build up and then coming down from it. So that kind of artificially, that, that sort of artificial creation of a single goal in the music was quite counterproductive. 
Um, and I think this is also in line with the above quote by Professor Bao Deshu, where he argues that Chinese music emphasizes intuition rather than rationality. So, uh, okay, so if we were to look at Everett's taxonomy of musical hybridity again, uh, this will probably sit somewhere between syncretism and synthesis. Let's now listen to my co-presenter Chen Zhang Yi's work titled Clima. Sorry, technical issues. <laughs> Let's try this again, yeah? screen to play the video. Yep. Yeah, what are you sharing? Sorry, we're having a bit of technical issues and we'll be with you right in a second. I think just to just to re reiterate the um the Ayoi Uno Everett's uh, framework, um uh, basically it's a spectrum between um transference um syncretism and then synthesis where uh, transference um, it's uh, what it transfers and then syncretism uh, still retains like tenders and scales of the ethnic or the Asian element um, maybe in a Western context so um, like Tony's piece would be um, the jewel of uh, Shrivijaya would be an example of a syncretic work um, as well as my, my own uh, triple concerto, also a syncretic work. We, it retains the, the, the distinct timbres um, of the Western orchestra, as well as the uh, Asian instruments. And then um, synthesis is where, where the, two, um, the two kind of sources of elements are fused together so that we can't dis distinct, uh, distinguish um, what is the you know, original source, then that, that, that is the most heightened form, I think, um, in according to Ayayoi's um, framework. So in any piece, it could, uh, it could um, well, any transcultural or multicultural work could, could lie on that spectrum. Yeah, I think now we are ready. Yeah, now we're ready. So let's listen to Zhang Yi's Climber. How?
let's talk about the sound road of this music. And uh, Zhang Yi, please feel free to jump in at any point. So I took special care to create a delineation of the melodic lines. Um, if you look at the score, as we go later, there are three different melodies that are always flowing simultaneously. And um, I thought it was very important to bring out the heterophonic texture of the music. Oh yeah, thank you for the very nice performance. And you memorized. Yes, I did. Oh, nice. So yeah, that, that's uh, I mean, it's a beautiful um, performance of, of that piece. And um, do you want to continue uh, talking about this, uh, this differences in the sound world um, that you, that's based on um, the Bao's um, aesthetical approach on this slide? Yeah, sure. Um, so, as I was saying, the texture is heterophonic, which is very characteristic of Chinese music, whereas Western music is often polyphonic or homophonic. So, you know, homophonic as in melody with accompaniment and polyphonic as in really well, different melodies, different voices coming together and emphasizing the vertical and counterpoint nature of this texture. So, in terms of sound world, rather than going for a large, rather than going for a large, rich and deep sound, I thought about tone in terms of saturation, bright colors versus darker colors, um, and I think you, I think this is especially uh, this is especially important for creating the delineation of lines in the in the compositional texture. So this is also in line with what Bao has described that of the timbre of traditional Chinese instruments that employ more delicate materials like bamboo and silk to create soft, fine, clear timbral characteristics instead of stronger materials like spruce and brass that are used for Western instruments to create a rich sound and a wide range of pitch. Um, out of the three pieces that I've discussed today, I think that Climber was maybe the most, the one that took the longest time to learn. Uh, the, it's very abstract, or rather it's more, the tonal language is more abstract and deviates from the musical language that I was familiar with. And interestingly, the three structure is cyclical rather than linear. So even visually from the score, next slide, we can see that the phrases and contour of each melodic line dovetails into each other, forming a beautiful undulating sort of wave-like series of semicircles. And the performance implication of this is that I have to use the pedal in a very creative way, half pedaling to blend phrases into one another while keeping the dovetailing effect of the phrase organization and actually just making that very clear through pedaling. And this is different from half pedaling and other pieces by composers who wrote prolifically for the piano, such as Debussy, Ravel, and Chopin where uh, when I'm playing their music, I'm thinking vertically about the organization of harmony and how do I blend sounds in order to create beautiful colors and harmony and create beautiful um, pairings of these colors. Rather, so for Zhang Yi's piece, I'm really thinking horizontally about the organization of melodic lines while clearly delineating the dovetailing and interweaving of this heterophonic structure. So to conclude, I think all three of these piano pieces necessitate a different... Oh, sorry. Zhang Yi, do you want to add anything? Oh, okay. Sure. So to conclude, all three of these piano pieces necessitate a different aesthetic and performance interpretation paradigm. But because of the scope of this presentation, we could only discuss three piano pieces. Uh, but I hope that this is the seed of further explorations of a larger collection of transcultural piano music in order to move towards creating a stylistic lexicon for approaching this piano music, which I think would be very helpful, not just to myself as a performer, but hopefully to make these musics more widely performed. 
So let me just chime in here uh, to disagree with the hydrophonic <laughs> um, <laughs> classification. Oh, as many people know, I, I am a fan of counterpoint and um, polyrhythms and harmony. So I, I would argue that uh, for this uh, for this piece, there's a great deal of counterpoint and counterpoint. It, it, it is horizontal and vertical at the same time where we we take note of what is the vertical harmonies what are the sounding sonorities at the same time but then how it unfolds is as what uh, children has mentioned maybe uh, in different cycles which may be a uh, borrowing of maybe gamelan uh, structures um, but here here i am trying to create three distinct layers in a way that is it, it is contrapuntal, but also uh, in different speeds. So uh, thinking of uh, you know um, Elliot Carter, I'm thinking about Ligeti, I'm thinking about counter uh, uh, the the colotomic structure of Gamelan. So uh, in in a way, I think uh, Chiru didn't mention this, but she she considers this piece as transference, and in a way where where. Uh, maybe Asian aesthetics are uh, transferred to a Western idiom or Western instrument uh, in, uh, in, in a way that is not syncretic, obviously, and no Asian scales, no Asian instruments, um, synthesis, not quite. So, so maybe, yeah, yeah, she's right in saying this is maybe the transference is the closest if we uh, go along the spectrum of um, Yayo Yuno Everett's. Um, Framework, yeah. So, um, but there there is a Singaporean element in in the sense that I was inspired by the climate, the this cool weather of the monsoon surge, um, in Singapore, and so there's a lot of this mention of uh, weather, like humid, like uh, scorching hot, like. Uh, Atmospheric, we're talking about the clouds. So, so like this, this is like cool with a shade of darkness. This kind of, uh, uh, which is another strand of uh, um, composition, as in uh, influence, uh, inspirations for me, which is nature in with in Singapore. You know, we have a lot of concrete, but we also have a lot of uh, trees and plants and. You know, so 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 is this balance between uh, the city and nature, between man and nature, and what and, and all this comes to play. What is what does it mean to be uh, at a place, and does it matter uh, where the com music is composed, how it's composed? Does it directly um, project a sense of identity, or whether the composer? Or the performer is not, uh, a, a, it, it is not necessary to really bring that up because uh, sometimes it, it might seem uh, really overtly nationalistic, which, which might uh, not be the point of artistic creation. Yeah, I I think I'd agree with that. Um, I just think that for me as a performer, approaching these music with the sort of mindset that I had about uh, how I would play a Western art music piece was not enough. I didn't quite have the tools that I needed based on the past, say, 20 plus years of playing a lot of Western art music. Yeah, so for me, this is a chance to get deeper into different cultures and to different the vocabulary, the aesthetics of different musical cultures. Um, and you're right, not with a nationalistic purpose, but more broadly speaking about transcultural music and how these stylistic influences just flow seamlessly between different geographies and cultures. So maybe to have a, have a concluding um, thoughts um, this in, in this in this uh, quotes from um, Desiree Lam's uh, book, uh, quite recent uh, book on Singaporean music culture and identity. Um, there's some of this uh, this 
confluence of these two frameworks that we are mentioning, the, the Singlish framework as well as the um, um, Everett's framework of uh, transference, um, syncretism and synthesis, where we take in uh, to consideration the factors of uh, globalization, shifting demographics, immigration, uh, where um, this cultural fluidity is, uh, it's, and hybridity uh, it should be celebrated. And it's not a static, oh, this is Singaporean music, this is not kind of thing, but we have to embrace the multiple identities of uh, so 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 taking Tony's example again, um, it, it is uh, his choice evoking the Indian um, musical references, but within a Western uh, orchestra setting. So um, there, and then uh, and in another instance, Tony might be playing bass in a jazz uh, in a jazz band. So so that that uh, that has different it, it depends on the context. A single person uh, uh, or even a group of uh, a musical group has, has can have multiple identities and it, it is much more complex than than a static thing. So so this uh, to borrow uh, Lionel Lee's argument for a more dynamic view of Singlish, we argue for a more dynamic way to look at Singaporean music. Cool. <laughs> so I think we have a couple of questions. All right. Oh, do you want to show the references? Oh, sure. Yeah. And so should I go first? Can. How do you want to read the questions or? Well, there's a question directed to me. I can oh, answer that. So Shu Xiang asks, Hey Chiren, I know your own research places the body front and center. Do you think that growing up and living in Singapore has shaped your sense of pianistic touch? So I think this issue of touch is one that is very culturally based. Um, and there are different schools of thinking about how touch, what is the ideal touch, the ideal sound, right? So we have, say, the German school, we have the French school, the Russian school, which is famed for um, emphasizing a deep, rich, and large-bodied tonal ideal. Uh, the French school was perhaps a little bit lighter, very clean, very delineated textures. Um, and the German school, yeah, again, a very, I think, a very solid sense of sound. Um, so I say that my idea of sound is maybe influenced by the if we go back to this to the idea that Bao De Shu had about um, Chinese instruments utilizing more delicate materials like bamboo and silk I say that my idea of touch is perhaps more delicate um, I really go for a more subtle palette and I think that served me well in playing music like Chen Wei's Mid-Autumn Festival um, where I explored a lot more of the softer sounds. Um, and, you know, this is very abstract and I'm only at the beginnings of this idea, but I think there is something about the body and where it's grown up with that has sort of just embodied the cultures, the sounds, the feel of the place, and I think somehow that is expressed through a performance relationship with their instrument as well. Yeah. So thank you for your question, Shooks. So maybe I, I answered the other question. Uh, this is by Hakim, uh, one of our first year, uh, very talented first year students uh, at YST. Would you agree that English is generally viewed as a violent language? Personally, I find the switch between standard English and Singlish connected to the switch in expression. 
especially with expression connected to violence, like being upset, joyous, and angry. Um, I wouldn't say violent, but uh, it could be um, more colorful, <laughs> more um, uh, well, less formal, definitely. And I, th I, I don't know, I find a sense of uh, c closeness and familiarity when I hear Singlish. And I, I, I find myself switching to Singlish when I'm speaking to a friend or when I want to be uh, more friendly <laughs> um, and less, you know, formal. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think, I don't think violence. I mean, unless you're talking about using, you know, borrowing Hokkien swear words or something. <laughs> um, but it's not necessarily violence, but definitely more. Um, vibrant and less proper <laughs> i that's i think it's the one of the one of the things about singlish is that uh maybe like 70 percent of singlish makes up mix up of is made out of english words so that is a convenient thing when you are writing an opera that uh, most of it can be understood and then the the other 25 30 percent might may be uh, more you know localized expressions. It could be words that are in, from borrowed from Malay, from Hokkien, uh, different dialects, and uh, of of course all these uh, very endearing ending words like la lo le, ha, that kind of thing. Uh, it makes it, it's very succinct. It's very concise and got me. It's <laughs> very direct. So uh, uh, in, in Lizare's book, uh, one of the chapters is re, uh, literally called uh, God Singaporean Sound, something like that, right? So, so, so that is really borrowing that Singlish um, model to look at uh, Singaporean music. So I don't think it's necessarily violent. So uh, there's another question from uh, my friend and colleague, Howard. Can you elaborate more on writing nationalistically on a personal level? Um, well, I think, I think it depends on the occasion. If, if it's, it is for a National Day concert, it, it is fine. You, you can be more patriotic. And uh, for, for, of course, my one of my most Patriotic works, I guess, is is uh, the Singapore trilogy, which is uh, which some people had had said, you know, it is a bold bold thing to call it a Singapore trilogy. So uh, of course, um, there's no there's there's good reason to call it Singapore trilogy based on the subject matters that that is uh, purposefully chosen. Um, in uh, other pieces like Vanda, it, it was written for. SG50, 50, 50 years of uh, independence. And uh, po poetically, I, 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 I think it, it, it works. I, I, I don't like to be nationalistic for the sake of it, to, for the sake of uh, getting grants or getting projects. That's less than a point. But uh, again, to, to, to quote Lizare, uh, Lizare Lum, uh, in, in, in the seminars of uh, uh, traditions. Um, she talks about this top-down approach and this bottom-up approach, which is, is it state-mandated uh, you know, policies of, okay, you have an orchestra made of CMIO, Chinese, Malay, Indian, and uh, other um, ethnic instruments. For example, Open Score Project is a great example. It's, it works great for like a poster, for like, you know, um, for a awards ceremony, for example. Um, but uh, the bottom-up approach is much more interesting because it's from the people, it's from the grassroots. Uh, like Singlish, it, it is a bottom-up uh, thing, right? It's, it's, not, uh, it's not officially endorsed by the government. That's why I think, that's why it, it, people like using it and, and we find joy using it and it, we find a, a sense of uh, belonging, which I think the well, authorities are, are, are kind of realizing that uh, at some point. But uh, again, balancing that with, with oh, okay, we have to you know 
Singaporeans have to learn correct English, you know, it has to be standard so people can understand us. Well, it's kind of nice if you can switch to Singlish and nobody understands you, right? When the occasion arises. So, but, but that's, I mean, just the cheekiness aside, I think uh, Singlish has, it's, uh, uh, it's a great resource that we, we can um, borrow from uh, and, and inform uh, different art forms and, and not just Singaporean music, it could be, uh, it has been informing Singaporean theatre for many years. Uh, music is always slow to the game, so we yeah, are trying to catch up. Any more questions? I think we have, so I think we have a follow-up question from Shu Xiang. How does your Singaporean touch affect how you play pieces in the Western canon? Great question, Shrooks. Um, I think that I'd like to nuance this a little bit by saying that I don't think I have a Singaporean touch, but more that I have my my touch and my approach to piano playing is the result of a wide variety of influences. My Asian heritage, um, my periods of study in America with a Hungarian pianist, and then later moving to Vienna to study with a German pianist. And then after moving to the UK to study with a, with an English pianist, so really this kind, this sense of multiculturalism is just so characteristic of people of our generation who are cosmopolitan and globalized. So you know, um, in terms of approaching pieces in the Western canon, I'd love to see just a variety of approaches and a multiplicity of voices that are made valid instead of certain traditions of piano playing that valorize their own culture above other types of piano playing you know i've i've received comments like oh you gotta play this the xx way i'm not gonna name like you know like as you have to play this according to the traditions of a certain country and thereby you know this kind of thinking just valorizes a whole geography over another and I don't think that's valid especially in today's day and age so I'd say that I am the product of all of the different types of training that I've gotten and also my heritage yeah so just to end it off we have a few plugs um, um, Tony uh, Shafika and Kors is playing a concert next uh, next Friday is it this Friday this Friday uh, online is, is free lunchtime concert. Um, they're going to improvise uh, with insp inspira uh, inspiration of the collection from ACM. And then the next Friday uh, is a project from my class. Uh, my class has um, uh, created a project called uh, Waves, uh, Wares and Waves uh, inspired by the tank shipwreck. So do catch that. We put a lot of uh, sweats and bloods into it. Uh, so thank you for listening and thank you Howard and Hakim for for the support and uh, have a nice dinner. Enjoy your evenings. <laughs> <laughs>